there, chemists. We've been looking at addition reactions in the first few lessons of this unit, and now we're going to segue into some different types of reactions. Some of these count as additions and some of them don't, but today they all have in common they are oxidations. We're incorporating oxygen into what used to be an alkene, and we're just looking at alkenes specifically. There's three new ones to use today, and what we'll see is that they make very useful functional groups that we can turn into other things. Uh, the first one is called epoxidation. Now if you remember what an epoxide is, that's that three-membered ring with an oxygen. So if I have an alkene, going back to using methyl cyclopentene again, the pi bond goes away, and you get a three-membered ring with an oxygen where the pi bond used to be. And you actually get syn addition. So I'm going to give these bonds some direction. Syn addition. Now I arbitrarily made it going into the page, but it could also be coming out of the page, so we'll see that you get that and the enantiomer. Uh, the way to do this is with a reagent known as MCPBA. MCPBA stands for meta chloro peroxy benzoic acid. You can see where the acronym comes from, MCPBA. And it looks like this. You can even decipher the name a little bit at a time. I see Benz right in the middle. So everyone should know what benzene is. That looks like this. You may not know what benzoic acid looks like, but it's just a carboxylic acid attached to the benzene. However, this is not benzoic acid. This is peroxybenzoic acid. And we use per to mean an extra oxygen. So this is peroxybenzoic acid. However, there's a meta and a chloro in the front of the name. Well, a chloro just means there's a chlorine somewhere else on the ring. And later on this year, we'll learn that meta refers to where on the ring it is relative to the other group that we're talking about. So that's meta chloroperoxy benzoic acid. The part that's important is just this functional group, this per acid group. And that's all I'm gonna use in the mechanism for this. Disclaimer, none of these mechanisms are ones you will have to reproduce for the purposes of this course. I'm gonna show them to you anyway, just so you can see where the product comes from. They're, they're kind of interesting, but they're all very unique compared to some of the things you saw in other reactions. Uh, the mechanism, I'm gonna redraw methyl cyclopentene. And I'm going to abbreviate that per acid. It's just that acid group that's important. So I'm going to abbreviate it a little bit. It's this group here that matters. And it actually happens all in one step. This is a concerted mechanism. Concerted meaning it happens all in one step. Per acids, like peroxides, are sources of electrophilic oxygen. So we have this extra oxygen that's quite electrophilic and can get attacked. So draw an arrow from your pi bond in the alkene to that oxygen. And at the same time, that same oxygen's lone pairs form a bond with one of the carbons of the alkene. And there's more. The oxygen-oxygen single bond is notoriously weak. And this one's even weaker because of the withdrawing effect of that neighboring carbonyl. So that oxygen-oxygen bond breaks, sends a pair of electrons onto that, one of the lone pairs actually becomes a double bond. That sends this pi bond up to that oxygen, and lastly, one of those lone pairs picks up that H and breaks the OH bond. If that isn't the most amount of arrows you've seen in a mechanism, I don't know what is. Some of them you could combine because they're arguably just different resonance contributors of them, so even though it looks like I have seven curved arrows on there, it's probably a perfectly acceptable way you could do it with only four or five. Nonetheless, if I follow all those curved arrows, this is what I get. Five-membered ring. Remember, your curved arrows tell you what you formed. We have a new carbon-oxygen bond, another new carbon-oxygen bond with the same oxygen. This oxygen-oxygen bond is gone. This oxygen-hydrogen bond is gone. But those atoms are still there. I still have the H and this other oxygen. Looks like this other oxygen is now doubly bonded to that carbon from the MCPBA reagent. The R group is still there. The other oxygen is now singly bonded and it's attached to the OH. So we made a byproduct out of this. And you're gonna get the enantiomer of the epoxide. Okay, that's how epoxidation works. One very fancy concerted mechanism, but all in one step. Let's look at a few others that also count as oxidations. The second one is called dihydroxylation. 
And most of these are descriptive names, meaning they tell you what it does. Dihydroxylation makes two hydroxyl groups attached to the alkene. So methylcyclopentene will become a diol. Two OHs attached to each carbon. And this goes with syn addition. I'm going to make these coming out of the page. Syn addition. This is called a 1,2 diol. And you would get the enantiomer as well, but it will also be syn. Uh, and how this happens, you react this with osmium tetroxide in the presence of a co-oxidant peroxide. So I'm going to draw the alkene. I'm going to draw it a little bit on its side, and you'll see why. So I have that alkene just pointed straight up and straight down, and that's because when it sees the osmium reagent, we haven't seen any osmium compounds in this class yet, but you can draw it like this, deep in the transition metals. When osmium tetroxide sees that, you get uh, one cyclization where the osmium oxygen bond forms a bond with one of the carbons of the pi bond. The pi bond breaks, forms a bond with the osmium oxygen over here, and the osmium oxygen bond goes down to the osmium, so it reduces the osmium. And you get, in that one step, two new carbon oxygen bonds at the same Time. And that's why you get syn addition, because that alkene latched onto those two oxygens simultaneously. That explains uh, why we get syn addition. This is called an osmate, it's a type of osmium ester. And this reacts with water. I'm not going to show the whole mechanism for this, it's not crucial. Uh, but water essentially attacks the osmium and kicks out those osmium oxygen bonds and then it does it again and you cap off those oxygens as H's. So I'm just going to show that with a couple of arrows. Meaning it's okay to skip the mechanism for that. But that's how you get your diol. Uh, there's peroxide in this reaction. Why do we have peroxide? Well, you, you synthesized a byproduct that's actually a reduced osmium species. And you need a co-oxidant. This is not part of the organic part of this reaction. This is like the inorganic stuff happening off on the side, but I'll show it anyway. Uh, but the co-oxidant regenerates your osmium compound. And that's good because osmium is quite toxic. You don't want to handle it too much. So this is actually catalytic in the osmium tetroxide. Okay, the main part I would say that's useful to recognize and understand is that because it shows you why we get syn addition. Uh, the last one is not taught in all your undergrad textbooks, but I think it's a very useful oxidation of an alkene. It's called the Wacker oxidation. It's German, so that W is pronounced Wacker. And it's a simple palladium catalyzed reaction with just oxygen and water. Uh, make a note, I'm only going to show you how this works on terminal alkenes. This is not specific for any alkene. We're just going to use terminal alkenes to show this. And you get a ketone. You get specifically a methyl ketone, meaning a methyl on one side. This is also quite a different mechanism, so I'll just show a little bit of it, but it has a feature or two that's reminiscent of other things you've seen. If I have the alkene, uh, it reacts with the palladium. And at the same time as it forms a bond with the palladium, you have water. So it forms a new bond between carbon that used to be the alkene and an oxygen. That would mean I now have some charges. I guess I would have a formal negative on the palladium and a formal positive on the oxygen. You actually lose HCl. I'm just going to write minus HCl from this. That gets you to a neutral intermediate. And then what happens is what's called a beta hydride elimination. So we haven't learned a whole lot of palladium chemistry. We've just seen it in hydrogenation reactions. But you can remove what's called a beta hydrogen, which is that one, one carbon away, 
from what I'm going to call alpha, where the palladium is attached. So on the beta position, we have a hydride, meaning a hydrogen and its electrons, and the palladium will take the H with its electrons. So the way to draw this is draw an arrow from the CH bond to the palladium. The palladium carbon bond becomes a carbon carbon bond. Oops, we actually lost one of those chlorines on the palladium, didn't we? There we go, that's correct. And you get a very familiar functional group. Hopefully you recognize that's an enol. And this will undergo a tautomerization to the ketone. Just like we saw in the previous lesson. Uh, looks like we made a byproduct with palladium. And this will turn back into your, your catalytic palladium source. I'm not even going to bother showing that. That's not relevant for the purposes of what we're learning about in this class. So that's how you can take alkenes and make ketones, 1,2-diols, uh, or epoxides, uh, three different reactions that incorporate oxygen. So let's just practice this. We've got a little more space here. Let's use this as an opportunity to do some examples. Uh, classify each transformation by the name and fill in the reagents. Well, this is an epoxide, so this is epoxidation. So MCPBA will do that. I'm gonna modify the drawing and show that it's syn addition and racemic. Uh, the next one makes two alcohols, so that's the second one, that's dihydroxylation. That would be osmium tetroxide and peroxide, those are the main reagents. Uh, there's no relative stereochemistry to show in this example, even though it's syn addition, I can't tell because that's not an asymmetric carbon. However, I would get the racemic mixture. So I'll put a little plus minus down there and I'll go ahead and give direction to one of them. And then let's just predict some products of these. How do we draw the products of an epoxidation of different alkene examples? So this alkene would turn into an epoxide. I get that. Don't you dare draw the racemic symbol for that. That's meso. Meso compounds do not have enantiomers. They are achiral. Even though they have asymmetric carbons buried within them, it's not a chiral compound overall. Uh, the dihydroxylation of methylcyclohexene is going to be very similar to what we saw with the cyclopentene. You get two OHs, both syn to each other, and you'll get the racemic mixture. Epoxidation of E would give you an epoxide. I'll show the relative stereochemistry with the oxygen bonded in the same direction on each. That is chiral. It's not meso, so you would have an enantiomer. And then two other example dihydroxylation. This one I'm just going to correct. It's missing the peroxide, but that's okay. Dihydroxylation of this would give you a 1,2-diol. That is a meso compound, so don't draw the racemic mixture. And then epoxidation of methylcyclohexene is going to be just like the cyclopentene up above. You get a syn epoxide, and this one is chiral. You'll have an enantiomer. So just a couple of examples to wrap up some of these oxidation reactions.